So happy to be part of Metal Arc. And the reason I am is the person I'm with, John Skipper, the CEO of Metal Arc, who somehow found his way to not pay attention to what anybody in the Levitard universe wanted and was willing to have me join because he loves these discussions so much, as do I and as do you. I'm David Sampson, former president of the Marlins, host of Nothing Personal with David Sampson, here with John Skipper, former president of ESPN and current CEO of Metal Arc Media. How are you, John? I'm very well, and welcome uh, to Metal Arc, David. I'm thrilled uh, to have you as part of the family. Of course, you were already part of the Libertard family, uh, but welcome. I appreciate that. Of course, you are the only one who has said that, and I still have no swag of any kind, but you really do make me feel welcome. I want to jump into it because your time is precious and we respect the time of the audience. It is opening for Major League Baseball, and that's exciting. For me, it was always my favorite was opening day. You get to wear the World Series ring. You get to celebrate the possibility of winning another one, being in first place. And, and John, I assume that you are equally as thrilled that MLB is starting. Uh, I will tell you, I am certainly more interested this year than last year. I think that the changes Major League Baseball made to the rules are good ones. They appear to have worked in spring training. So, yeah, I'm anxious to see how the uh, base stealing goes up and there's less positional shifting that looks silly on the field. And uh, hopefully the games will be quicker. So, yeah, I am absolutely uh, interested and encouraged about what's happened in spring training. We were always so focused with ESPN, with our TV partners about the length of game and about the dead time that was in the game. Mm -hmm. And these rules were really, really meant to address that. They were done for the TV product. Our fans, when we talked to them, very few people in the ballpark would say to us, man, this game is too long. We don't like three and a half hour games. But the broadcasters, on the other hand, would always complain about the windows being open for too long. Did you get involved in any of the rule changes? Did you want rule changes when you were a rights holder for baseball? Um, when I was president of ESPN, we had discussions with um, Major League Baseball about changes. When Rob Manfred became the new commissioner, he clearly wanted to make some changes, and we had some good discussions. Not our decision, obviously, but we did relay what we would like to see, and the things they're doing are the kinds of things we wanted to see. But it would be your decision if you were willing to say during those meetings that you would pay more for more concentrated windows of content. Uh, the, that would have been a stimulant to faster innovation, which we did not make. Well, that is something that we wanted you to do. So we would talk about you, actually. This is a side note, John. We would say, how's Skipper doing? Is he good? Like, is he satisfied? And of course, the response would be, yeah, I think he'll show up to a World Series game for five minutes. He'll say hello to everybody, but his checks are always going to clear. So that was something that mattered more, but we always wanted you to be more engaged in baseball. So I'm actually happy that these rule changes are impacting you, but uh, it's a little late, but thank you on behalf of Major League Baseball. <laughs> you're, you're, you're very welcome, but kudos to... Uh... To Mr. Manfred and, and baseball, I think they're uh, going to see uh, more interest this year. When you talk about a rights deal, this has been in the news and we've acknowledged that the number one story, John, is the bankruptcy of Diamond, which is mm -hmm. Valley Sports Networks, which are 14 major league teams with their regional sports networks. Those networks are now bankrupt. In the news this week was the Padres, and I can tell you exactly how this went down. The Padres are refreshing their account, their inbox, to see whether or not they were going to get their rights fee payments. Little known fact is that the rights deals, you actually are paid seasonally. You negotiate that in your deal that you can be paid all year long. But teams, our team, we want it to be paid seasonally because our expenses are much higher when we're paying our players April through October. So the Padres were waiting, as was major league baseball to see whether diamond would pay the rights fee and on the last day with five hours left they decided to pay what they owed the padres i would not have waited that long if i were diamond because i know that's what mlb wanted which was for them not to pay do you are you with me in understanding and explaining why it is in the best interest of the padres to have not gotten paid but it's in the best interest of diamond to have made the payment no, I can't uh, tell you that I have an acute knowledge of that. 
Make me smarter, please. No, but I, I want to know in your mind, no. when you have a deal that you know is not profitable, is it not in your best interest to get rid of that deal? It seems counterproductive to me to where they're going, um, going in the end here, which is I, I don't know what they think they're going to gain uh, by paying the Padres for this season uh, when the deal is untenable. So they're trying to get the streaming rights. I mean, let's face it, it's all about streaming rights, and that's been the negotiation this entire time post-bankruptcy, pre-making the payment. There was a negotiation with the Padres saying, we'll pay you, but please give us the digital rights to your games, and MLB was a hard no. The Padres were not allowed to give up those rights back to Diamond because MLB wants all of them in-house, like your friend Don Garber with MLS, and that became a huge, huge issue because that's where the money is. So the point, the question is, how when do you draw the line in terms of your negotiation when you give up on digital rights? Well, at ESPN, we not, we drew the line that we would not buy any games that did not come with digital rights. Uh, I've never baseball is the only league that still stubbornly clings to the idea that streaming rights and broadcast rights are any different now. They're not. There is no broadcaster who is not also streaming. So. The, those games are not exclusive by by that definition. But Diamond was willing to do the deal. They made the payment under terms of their old existing contract with the Padres. They made the decision to actually not become in breach. The way it works is if you are in breach, you don't pay your rights fees, then the team gets a chance to void the contract. And it would be unheard of for a team to void a TV deal over the past 15, 20 years. But the days are different now and the Padres wanted to void the deal, but now can't because the Diamond Bally's San Diego paid the bill. Are you going to pay it next month? Because that's a big discussion right now. Are you going to keep paying it and keep trying to get the digital rights? Or are you going to let it go? If I was them, I would let it go. And I'm not sure I understand what value the thing, the Padres think they're going to get by retaining the digital rights that's going to offset the losses they're going to have from losing the broadcast. The payments. Padres, and here's the answer. Do you, there's a rule in baseball about the amount of debt that a team can have. And baseball and the commissioner have a right to enforce certain rules against the owner of the Padres, Peter Seidler, who is running a huge payroll, third highest. San Diego has the third highest payroll this year. They are losing money hand over fist. And Rob Manford could throw down the hammer on the Padres if he chose to. So the commissioner's office is very much driving what the Padres are doing. And the reason why the commissioner's office wants these rights in house is they want the ability to increase revenue sharing to help change and lessen the economic disparity that exists. And broadcast and broadcast revenue is the number one maker of disparity in all of baseball. Mm -hmm. um, I hear that what I still don't understand is the mathematics of trying to replace the RSN money with any sort of direct to consumer subscription service. Do you think that Yes Network with their announcement yesterday will be able to replace the Yankees could replace their entire TV deal $24.99 at a time? No, I do not think so. 29 24.99 is a lot of money. That's uh you could get Netflix and and uh, Amazon and Apple I think for that amount of money and I, I think by comparison to the market, they will limit themselves to the ca cadre of very hardcore Yankee fans. This was a big announcement that just happened, John. So there's people who do not agree with you at all because Yes Network just announced. And that's actually what baseball is hoping for, except not by the Yankees. So a little nugget here is that the Yankees announced Yes Network and the Yankees own a part of Yes Network announced that they are starting a subscription service where you can get the Brooklyn Nets, the New York Yankees, the New York Liberty, all for the great price of $24.99 a month, an introductory discount of $19.99. And that is your ability to stream games in market, which is the goal of every team. The problem, John, is that most teams don't control their own in-market streaming. And the other problem is they don't own their own network. So yes, network having this ability is actually hurtful to the game, but helpful to the Yankees.
I agree completely with that. It's the would be the most valuable content in a league wide product, but the Yankees are not going to give it up. And the Yankees are going to be successful because of the size of their fan base. But the success is not going to come because they get people to pay twenty four ninety nine a month. We we broadcast lots of Yankee games for free. The regional sports networks are free to people who have a cable television. So the and if you look at the ratings of those games and think that everybody who watched those games for free would pay $24.99, it still wouldn't replace the money. So, it's and if free. only 10% of the people who watch pay $24.99, they will, their revenues will go down by two thirds. I'm, I'm not, I cannot believe that you would want to tell me that it is free to have cable. Uh, it, while not free, you have no idea how much you're paying to get a Yankees game. The only point I'm making is expecting more people to pay for a subscription than currently watch your team, which is on free pay television. I got it. You pay for it. That's an oxymoron, of course. And uh, so uh, I, I, it's, yeah, I do believe that the person who has a pay TV sub has it for sports overwhelmingly. They cut it on. They don't go, oh, that just cost me twenty four ninety nine. dollars uh, It doesn't. It costs them about three or four bucks. Most people don't know that. Uh, and people who are paying three or four bucks are not going to pay twenty four ninety nine dollars to watch Yankee games. <laughs> so are you now saying, and I'm just getting to know your politics and know you, and I'm going to, let me see if I get this right, Mr. Skipper. How are you not in favor of people paying for only what they want and not what they don't want? Um, it sounds like a great concept, but like most things in life, I'd like to just pay uh, for the parts of my apartment I use and not pay for the parts I don't use. I'd like to uh, uh, go to a buffet and be able to just eat shrimp and pay for whatever the shrimp costs. It doesn't work that way, and it's not necessarily a better value. Bundling works for a reason. Yeah, to take advantage of the consumer. Um, to make the consumer believe that they're getting more value, and they often are. So are you in complete disagreement with the way that the world is going, which is people are getting to choose what they want to stream, when they want to stream it? No, so I, I believe in it. All I'm speaking to are the economics of the business. And that is why there is so much disruption right now in entertainment media companies is that when people have the right to pick only what they want, they don't want to spend more money. And the bundling of pay TV disguised the fact that it was a great value getting 250 channels, even if you didn't watch, but eight to 17. And when you have to pay to get those eight to 17, it's going to cost you more money. How in favor were you of ESPN plus? Uh, I was in, it was inevitable and completely necessary, but it's not going to result in a better business than the old pay TV uh, branded consumer advertising pay TV universe. It's not. So that means that if you're a shareholder of Disney and they're investing money or a shareholder or Time Warner investing in CNN Plus, which got completely destroyed after one day, you believe that will have a negative impact on earnings per share versus, but a positive impact on who? Because you're saying the consumers, it's not positive. For shareholders, it's not positive. So where's the excitement? In sports, the in sports, it's not going to be particularly positive for fans who will ultimately end up having to figure out where to find their games and who, if they want to watch as many games as they used to watch on pay TV, will have to spend more money. It's not better for the the uh, sports media companies. Their business will not grow, but a company like the Walt Disney Company is a portfolio company, and their job is to figure out how to make more money in parks if ESPN goes down a bit and how to make more, how to buy new kinds of entertainment, make more movies, create a streaming service. So it's a portfolio company. They expect that some of those, some of the divisions will be ascendant and some will be stagnant and some will be declining. That's the way every business is, right? You're always yeah. looking to see if you're staying, if you're staying still, your business is failing. You either, and that's how you build a team on the field, by the way, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. No team is ever staying the same. But what fascinates me about this is as a team, what we're looking for is a better experience. That's why there's rule changes in baseball. That's why we want to get in market streaming because people are unhappy with blackouts. We want 
ingress and egress to a ballpark to be easy. We want you to be able to find the channel where your team is on. We want that to be easier. So networks work on the guide and cable companies work on how the guide looks. So we spend our entire time trying to increase our industry revenue and doing that by making the customer happier. And what concerns me is that your belief is that all of the change that's happening, that Yes Network just announced, that MSG Network just announced, is actually negative. And I'm not sure how to how to deal with that because if you're right, that means franchise values are gonna go down, rights deals are gonna go down, payrolls are gonna go down, and that's a problem. Well, I'm not sure it's an existential problem. The value of sports overall is not going to decline. Um, and eventually, the leagues will have to figure out how to have their partners make it more seamless to know where you can find, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the games of of the league. And it'll mean that they'll have to, for, for years there, there, it was impossible to even get the broadcast networks to say, oh, you're watching um, – you're watching an NBA game on ESPN. If you want to watch the game tomorrow night, it's on TBS. Uh, I think it was David Stern or David Stern and Adam who kind of forced the hand of ESPN and Turner to say, oh, we're going to promote the other the other uh, broadcast networks games. At ESPN, we, we believed in it. We were the most willing participant because we believed that the rising tide of sports helped ESPN more than anybody else just because we had more content. The traditional broadcast networks, oh my gosh, at NBC and CBS, the idea that you would uh, we, we, the NFL did the same thing. So NBC had a responsibility to promote the Monday night game. And you've never heard a more lethargic, unenthusiastic promotion than, oh my gosh, you better watch Monday night. Uh, cause it's going to be great. Um, we would notice that with the live reads, you're talking about live reads that announcers do where they yes. have to talk about like coming up after the game, 60 minutes, except on the West coast, right? They never right. say what's coming up on NBC or on Fox when you're seeing the CBS games. That's right. funny that you say that, uh, we would give reads. Do you ever have, do you ever have talent who didn't want to do reads? Can you imagine if somebody would actually not do the reads that the network demands? We had that with some broadcasters and we would give them promotions that we wanted them to do for Marlins games. And sometimes they would balk at it and we would say, that's fine. You want to balk at it. We're going to find someone else to be the broadcaster of your games. I don't um, know if you ever had that in your career. I can imagine that scenario. Yes. It's a difficult one. Can we go back to bundling? Because I'm still shocked that when we bundle things together, that it's not going to be good. And when we let people watch what they want, let me give you some pricing and let me spend some of your money because God knows after our negotiation, you have more to spend. So here we go. Ready? Uh huh. Netflix, $15 and 49 cents a month. The mm -hmm. Disney bundle, that's you, 19.99. Mm -hmm. Amazon, 9 99 you can do all this right now. Yes, streaming. So I get the Yankees and the Nets and the Liberty, $24.99. That's a total bill of $70.46. Now compare it, John, to YouTube TV, which is $72.99 a month. They just raised the price. Right. So if you want cable, that's $72.99 a month, which is what YouTube TV is or Hulu Live is. Add the 70 bucks per month for these streaming services and you're at $143.5 for everything you could ever want to watch except for HBO, Apple TV. What, do you not see the value in that? Uh, the cable TV bundle at its highest was sort of 80 to 100, $110. So yeah, you say $40, it was easier. You had one party to pay and you knew where everything was, it was better. So that's not true because the bundle you're talking about for cable at 80 did not include any of the premium channels. I had to pay extra to get HBO or any of the movie channels. All of the pay TV is what they were called. I had to pay extra on cable. Well, for the most part, people didn't think they needed them. Uh, HBO peaked at about somewhere between 25 and 30 million. So the vast majority of people never had HBO. Um, and HBO was part of a larger portfolio at a big company. So it was okay. It was quite profitable. But at this point, everything because of streaming is equal. Uh, you know, everything is national. Everything is our, is as archival uh, inventory and uh, catalog on it. 
And there is so much more content that people want. Right now, if if you want to watch the hit shows on the big streamers, you're going to be well beyond. I don't know. I don't think you included Paramount in that calculation you just made. I don't think you included nope. Peacock. I don't think you included AMC or BET or any of uh, Telemundo, Univision. I don't think you included any of those. You add all those up, you're 300 bucks. And you used to get pretty much all of that with a hundred dollar subscription to Comcast or direct TV or to dish. But I didn't want all of it. Well, great. Now you can only get the things you want and it'll cost you more than it costs you to get a bunch of stuff you didn't need. Plus everything you wanted. Oh my gosh. You're being so interestingly grumpy on this because <laughs> I want to pay. If I'm going to have to pay what I was paying anyway, then I don't want to pay for the 200 channels that I didn't watch. And I'm going to be a Yankee fan. And now we're getting to the meat of the issue. If I'm a Yankee fan, I'm going to pay for it. If I'm a movie fan, I'm going to pay for Netflix. But if the, if the, availability on Netflix and the movies stink and they don't get enough first rate shows, I'm going to go to the next place because I get what I want. And that's the problem that now there's going to be such disparity in the companies, which is why there's going to be consolidation in the streaming world, but you can't do that consolidation in the sports world. So what they do instead is called revenue sharing. That's their definition of consolidation. And my point to you was that's where we're headed with Yes Network doing what they're doing, with MSG doing what they're doing, all the big market teams having a payroll the way they have, you are gonna have this issue where consolidation can happen, but guess what? You are gonna need to find a way to get more money to the teams who can't charge twenty four ninety nine. Yeah, and look, David, it's, it's worth acknowledging that you and I can buy all the channels we want. Most people in this country are going to have to make a decision. Uh, they cannot afford to pay $250, $300 a month for cable television. We live in a country where half of the people do not have $1,000 in the bank uh, in savings. So they cannot decide to buy all of the sports they want. But you agreed that you'd put the Super Bowl behind a paywall. I would. So I'm just I, pointing I out. Didn't, I didn't say everything. I didn't say life was fair <laughs> or equitable. I thought that that was your whole raison d'etre was to make life fair and equitable. And I never understood that being, being in charge of big business, how you could ever think that way. Um, I think that a more fair and equitable society would be a good thing and wouldn't affect the people uh, at the top of that food chain at all. Boy, that's a whole nother show we can do. I can't yeah. wait to do it because it's not that we are going to be uh, – the Hatfield and the McCoys on this, but I think it's there's some nuance in the in the argument, and that nuance happens in the boardrooms. It happens in Major League Baseball. I want to talk about the WBC. Did you watch any games on the WBC? No, but I followed it digitally, and I followed it on um, the Athletic and the New York Times, so I knew what was going on. Do you know what the last at bat was in the WBC? No, I know that Japan beat the United States in the last in that at bat. I love this. So this is, I always love using you as my bellwether for whether or not I live in a bubble. I assume that everyone in the world knew that Shohei Otani struck out Mike Trout to win the game for Japan. And are you hearing this for the first time? No, I did read that. I didn't commit it to the small amount of memory I have left. I didn't really use it on that fact because it wasn't that important to me, but it was certainly you couldn't write the script better than that. So does that mean that you don't know the type of pitch that he threw to strike out Mike Trout? I do not. Because that would be, because that means you didn't see the video of it. Is that true? Well, that's true. Okay. I like how you allocate your time and I have total respect for that. I think you were the only one in the world who didn't see the slider from Otani that got out Mike Trout. But that's okay. I have not lost respect for you. I'm just disappointed as baseball season is starting. And the WBC, which was such a great launching point for the Major League Baseball season, that it seems to have already lost the luster of in the, in the momentum that, that baseball had, I guess is sort of in the toilet. But can we talk WBC? It was a great, great moment for broadcasters. The dream was to make it a global event. And the numbers, the ratings internationally were simply spectacular. Does the NFL even get a 48-7 share? Uh, for the Super Bowl, yes. And that's it, something, right? Something in that range, yes. 
So, and I'm not talking in the U.S. because that's not what happened, but five and a half million people did watch in the U.S. across FS1, and it was not on Big Fox, which was a major bone of contention for MLB, by the way, that the WBC final would not be on Big Fox. I'm hoping, would a good result change your mind when you are doing the programming where you would move something from ESPN2 to ESPN or from ESPN to ABC? Who made those decisions? Um... It was often contractual, um, but of course we could always upgrade without, and that would not be considered a violation of the contract. Um, look, I'm assuming Fox has real reasons to put that on FS1. They do get distributor fees still, and they need to put some things on it to justify that. It's also on Fox Deportes, I believe, mm -hmm. so they get some money for that from the distributors. They could have had, I don't know, uh, what was on Fox at the time, but I'm assuming there would be displacement. And, and uh, while it looks like it might make more money, it probably wouldn't have made more money by moving it over to, to Fox. So, so it was a good business decision for them. The increase in ratings, if you moved it to Fox, is not that dramatic. They did, what, 5.2 million? They might have done six, six and a half million people on Fox. They wouldn't have done That's eight or it. ten. Yeah. Wait, you're saying there's only a 15 to 25 percent increase by moving it when when something went from ESPN to ABC, that was the jump. Yeah, now that's my data. Whether Fox and Fox and FS1 have a dramatically different result, I doubt it. But uh, at ESPN, we believed it was 15 to 20 percent. And when you were thinking about upgrading a show, because wow, that's a way smaller upgrade than I would have figured, because there's no concomitant increase in the rights fee that you pay. So what would be your reason then for giving it a bigger platform? The reason would be because uh, relationships, because you wanted to grow the brand. And of course we put, when we put stuff on ABC, we called it ESPN on ABC because you could sell more advertising, but usually the net increase by moving it, selling slightly more advertising did not replace the money that ABC was already making on whatever they were running at the time. So what it used to be, and now we're going to age ourselves a little bit, but when you were not showing first run shows, so there were times during ABC's run or NBC or CBS that the shows would be seasonal. And right during the summer, they would show mm -hmm. repeats, believe it or not, of shows that had premiered earlier mm -hmm. in the year on the channel. Now there's new original content always on every channel. So I, I don't understand how the math is still the same because what you're saying, you displace what would have been on ABC if you're going to show a sports game. There are other places to show it now, like on your streaming app. So don't Correct. you have to do the math differently? So how walk me through how that math would be different. Um, I'm not, I, I, I think you've lost me. Okay. Um, Let me ask it another way, John. I'm trying to figure out from a broadcaster standpoint, you are putting your schedule together. You are making a decision that you like what's on ABC and you put the sport on ESPN. But then you see a, you have to be flexible. There's all this interest in Japan, USA, World Baseball Classic. Why mm -hmm. couldn't ESPN decide at the last minute to move it to ABC and do that upgrade? Is it because they don't have time to sell into it or because they don't know what to do with the displaced original content that invariably would be on that channel? It, it actually, at least in my experience when I was doing it, was even more fundamental, which is ABC decides what goes on ABC. And um, so you would have to make them whole. And by the time you made them whole for what was displaced, the upgrade and the amount of advertising you would run would not be worth doing that. It didn't add up. You would, you'd be doing six on ESPN and six on ABC. You'd move the ESPN show to ABC and you'd do eight. But you add up six and six, it's 12, and you had to pay ABC for the displacement cost, and it wasn't worth it. Who's making Not to that mention decision? the fact that most of our money came from the distributors. So we were more interested in making them happy. So now we're up. Now, now I think that was the main thing that you just said. So you're actually, it's not the consumer that's front of mind or the ease or the sport or the people in the sport, it's actually the distributors. Yes, and it's the uh, it's the business. Like we frequently commented that you know for the most part the business of sports run by the leagues or by the teams or the owners or the colleges or the uh, 
Um, sports administrations of colleges are not making decisions. They're very seldom making decisions, but to the benefit of fans. I just think it's a different world now. There, there was just, did you see, I know that how interested in how much you do to promote women's sports, the women's tournament, the NCAA tournament, uh, the elite eight, they put Iowa and Louisville. That was a game on ESPN and that drew two and a half million people. But they put UConn and Ohio State on ABC, and that was outdrawn by ESPN. And that's yeah. something that was unthinkable 10 or 15 years ago, right? Yeah, as I said, our, our differential generally was 15 to 20%. The UConn-Connecticut game sounds like the better matchup uh, and would have generally outrated the other one. If you put either of those, both of those games on the same network, the UConn game would have outrated the other one. So that's pretty remarkable that ESPN outrated with Iowa. And um, I'm Ooh. sorry, I've forgotten Ooh. who they played. So that Ooh. so it's 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 meant to illustrate that the TV industry, the disruption going on, we, we talk about it every show because every two weeks or every week there's disruption happening. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what is amazing. So now let's go and talk about what is gonna happen as you think about this TV industry going forward. And I don't know that we talked about this pre-show, but this just has occurred to me. Where are we going? Because if all this disruption's happening and all of what the industry norms were, where it was a rights deal and you had sports networks that were in a bundle on a cable network, when you're negotiating your next rights deal and you are doing it for ESPN with, let's say, basketball, what are, what are the top two things that you are going to demand, John? If you are gonna be asked to pay three times what you're paying or two times what you're paying, given what we're seeing with streaming and everything else, what are your top two demands of the league? Um, I probably want to figure out more ways to generate more advertising revenue. So it's loosening up of sponsorship regulations or, or um, limitations. And the second thing is I want to grow ESPN plus. So I want more flexibility to put better games on ESPN plus because ultimately I have to drive people to that subscription service as pay TV continues to decline. Were you able to use money as a sword during your negotiations with the leagues? You did. It's not a sword that uh, chops off heads, but it is a sword. But yes, the, we, we would frequently want to go first and help the league set the market. First of all, we could afford to pay more. And by going first, we would say, yeah, we'll help you set the market, but we have to get more value. So these, we need you to help us have less blackouts. We need you to help us have less sponsorship limitations. You need to help us give us more games. We'll take, and when things came up like the World Baseball Classic, yeah, we said, we'll give you more money. We want some new stuff. We want a new special event. It's why Adam is talking about a tournament in the middle of the season because we need some more bells and whistle. We need, by the way, some more playoffs. Um, as you know, for the broadcaster's point of view, it would be okay if um, the leagues played about half as many games as they played, uh, and then everybody went into the playoffs and played four out of seven. Uh, there's more money in that than there is in uh, a regular season game. So, yeah, there you can use the negotiations as a way to get things you want. What if I thought and suggested to you that with the streaming services doing what they're doing now, that this could be the first step to actually not just making regular seasons shorter, but even eliminating regular seasons? Because what you're saying is you'd pay for an only playoff. That's what you did when you negotiated for the World Cup. Isn't that a playoff tournament in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but however, you can't eliminate the regular season. Uh, then you have no way to know it, it by definition. It's like saying, gee, I like the icing in an Oreo. So let's just eliminate the crackers and just get the icing. It's not a good product. Um, by the way, it's called cookie dough. Exactly. It's exactly a good product. They sell cookie dough, John. Well, well they do sell cookie dough, but, uh, but I don't eat much cookie dough. I prefer oh. to have my cookie dough cooked into a Toll House cookie. Except you want to make sure you don't overcook it. We can beat this one to death. And the a regular season that's too long is the same as an overbaked cookie. Therefore, we are trying to figure out the right temperature. And that's what the negotiations always are. And that's where the conflict comes is when two sides have a different view of the right temperature of the cookie. I've never been in alignment with you negotiating with you, actually. Not, not even one time. 
Um, well, I didn't think we were negotiating anything right now. Oh, no, we're giving people content and I'm happy to be doing it with you, but it's just reminding me I'm having a little PTSD thinking about all the negotiations that I've done with you in the past. And the irony is that I'm, I think I am winless against you, actually. Well, I doubt that. I think you must be negotiating for something right now about positioning yourself as a poor, poor loser in negotiations. I'm going to have to make something up later. It's just more negotiation. I have no idea Let's what keep- you're talking about. <laughs> Good, good. Okay, can we, speaking of negotiating, uh, it's hard to negotiate when you're fired. I think we can all agree with that. Bob Iger sent a memo recently, a memo that no one wants to write, no one wants to receive. It's happening across industries everywhere. Uh, you have you have technology companies who are doing mass layoffs and you've got Disney who is doing mass layoffs. Uh, what, what, when did you do your biggest round of layoffs at ESPN? What year was that? It would have been sometime um, between 12 and 18. Uh, and we had this happen at least two times, maybe three times. Uh, in each case, there were hundreds of employees. It's very difficult and very painful. And nobody has any fun doing this. It can feel cold-hearted and it can be cold-hearted. But it's unfortunately good business at this point in the United States. Did People you workshop work to- it with a lawyer, John? That memo Pardon? that Bob Iger wrote, he didn't actually write that memo, right? He workshopped that with lawyers. Certainly no memo would go out about layoffs that wasn't uh, that wasn't at the advice that what didn't include some advice from a lawyer and from an HR uh, HR consultant. And just to be clear, the reason why we do that is that we need to be in a position that if we are ever sued for wrongful termination, that we've got all the files papered and that we've done everything by the book to ensure that we do not have exposure to any employees who are being let go. Are you, you'll acknowledge that that's the case, correct? I will, and that is overwhelmingly about uh, protecting people's civil rights and uh, because people who are employed at will, you don't have to provide a reason uh, and you don't really need to consult with anybody. You have to try to be as fair as possible. You have to try to be as kind as possible, but all you have to do really is to show that there is no pattern of discrimination against uh, against uh, protected classes of human beings uh, appropriately, and that that's really your legal work. Is that how much work, how much leverage or leeway did you give people below you to decide who was going to be chopped? Did you, and that's such an unemotional way of saying it, but did you give a bottom line number? I've done this to people who run departments saying, this is where the amount of savings we need from you. Now you tell me where you're going to take it from, or did you go through names yourself and decide? No, it was a 95 plus percent done uh, because it needed to be done by people within individual departments because they understood what had to be done. The main thing you I had to do was hit an overall number. It's not about number of employees. It's about money. And one of the cruel things you find out pretty quickly is laying off people who don't make much money uh, doesn't do you much good. It's sort of like cutting a player who's making $300,000 on the bench doesn't do you any good. You want to change your payroll? You got to get, you know, you've got to trade or cut somebody who was making 15 or 20 million. So you will see. As you just saw, they laid off the chairman of Marvel and the president of Marvel, merged the Marvel entertainment business into another another um, uh, division. That, of course, is about rivalries internally, but it's also about money. You uh, you have to you have to lay off people in very prominent positions in order to make save money, and this that's what this is about: is saving money. So they people don't have can, a problem with the number of chairs. So people can price themselves out of a job. I don't know about that, but um, you probably are at somewhat greater risk if you're making a million dollars and if you're making 39,000. Do you not look at, repl- see, I, there are people who would say the opposite. So if you are the the head, if you're, and, I, and there's no reason to pull out this name, but let's just say Scott Van Pelt, and I have no information about him. He is someone who is clearly paid well and has a very unique and highly skilled and in, potentially difficult to replace position. Wasn't it your sort of thought, the concept in baseball's calls is called replacement. In business, it's the replacement cost. Do you not make that evaluation? Who can do the same job for the lesser amount of money? Isn't that yeah. the equation that you do with everybody? 
Yeah, of course you do. And and look, you start with there clearly are a group of people who are untouchable because their impact on your business is so high. And Scott Van Pelt would fall into that category. Um, there is no shot that he's on any list coming up. He has a very valuable late night sports center. He's a unique talent. Uh, that's not what this is about. The people at greatest risk are in the third quartile, right? Your bottom quartile, they don't make enough money. Your top quartile, they're too important. And the people who make big salaries but can be replaced by somebody in the first or second quartile are the people at most risk. It's it's great because you're saying that you let other people do the evaluation and decide where the money was going to come from. But it also sounds like as president of ESPN or of any company that if you saw an easier path to hit the numbers you needed to hit, that you would go ahead and enforce that path. Because yes. that's what I would do. Yes, you do that. And I have to say, this also becomes a bit of an exercise in um, you start with people. We used to start, we always had performance reviews and you get from a five is the best and one is the worst. You started with, gee, the people who got re reviews of one, two, are, they're, on, they're the first ones on the list. The problem is, you may not get to enough money by just eliminating the poor performers. You have to eliminate some good performers who make money to your point. Exactly. It's analogous to a baseball team who can be replaced by somebody who, um, uh, who is there. Your biggest issue then back to your point about legal is that cannot be age-based. So you cannot simply say, Oh, I've got young people coming up. We'll let a bunch of 50 plus people go. Uh, you have to be careful not to trip that wire. We would say that we were eliminating the position. But well, it's very I always difficult. love that. They yes. call it in Europe, you know, uh, what do they call it? Shoot, they call it uh, not duplication, but there's a word where they pretend that, well, we actually have two people doing that job and we only need to have one of them. So it, that is one of the ways around And I'm not saying that this is, this is what we would do on a consistent basis, but when you are in an organization, one of the ways to get around some of the legal uh, barriers to lowering your expenses is to say that we're not hiring that, but we've literally just eliminated the position. But for a network or a baseball team, we couldn't say we're eliminating shortstop, right? ESPN can't say they're eliminating the 11 p.m. sports center. That would, is too easy to figure out. But you can certainly say we're eliminating the coordinator in the marketing department, right? So, so there are different ways around it. But sometimes you need a loss leader and you think about when you're building your company up, making investments into things, are you surprised that the NFL and what their position is with the USFL or the XFL, do you think that those leagues actually help the NFL the way that the NBA invests in the WNBA Inc., in the development league and the G League, where you are trying to get a pipeline, you're trying to improve the overall health of the sport? Are you a buyer of that? No. Can you, <laughs> is that it? <laughs> Boy, that's compelling television there. I'm trying All to right, provide our much. viewers with concise, to the point information. No, I don't, uh, the, the NFL has actually been sort of surprisingly cordial uh, in uh, relationship with the XFL and the USFL. Do I think it provides them any particular benefits? I do not, other than sort of a general sense that more football would make the NFL more important. Uh, I've never believed in spring football. Uh, I don't think people want to watch a whole bunch of people uh, uh, who can't make it to the NFL play in, uh, play in the spring. And so far, they're exactly zero uh, spring, zero successful spring, professional spring football leagues. And I do not think that number will change. But they all got broadcast deals. Why they is that? Got, uh, because people love football and uh, hope springs eternal. And people always think somebody charismatic or interesting will come along. They'll get a bunch of investors who love the sport and they'll start doing it. The ratings for either of those sports, either of those leagues this year were pretty modest and they will decline over time. Did you come across the deal when XFL was in bankruptcy from Vince and, and when The Rock took it over? Did you take a look no. at that deal? No. Would you invest it in that deal? No. How come? Because I don't think it'll ultimately work. I don't, again, I don't think there's the talent level, name recognition, desire for people to watch more professional football that will cause those leagues to get the big, big enough ratings 
to drive enough money to pay better players to come. But just, I don't see it. I don't see it. How do you explain minor league baseball though? Minor league baseball is a development system. It's not a TV sport. But the value of those teams continues to go up. So you have, if you have an opportunity to buy the XFL and own those teams as a potential minor league uh, pipeline to the NFL, to me, that seems good. The NFL has a spectacular development uh, system, and it's called college football. Uh, this doesn't do them anything that college football doesn't do for them. So the NFL is not going to put money behind this. I don't see, I don't see what it does. I will not bring you the investment deck when it comes across my desk next time. But what I will do is ask you to do another episode with me as part of Metal Arc as we continue this. We're out of time right now because you have a hard out. I appreciate this, but let's do this again. All right, Sean? See, that's a baseball term, right? You're including me now in the world of baseball. I'm a hard out. See you later. Okay. Bye-bye. That's a hard out. Thank you, David.